just to remember that uh, closing line alone would be enough to take with you uh, from this service. Well, we had some technical problems even in the production of the bulletin this week, so um, I must uh, tell you that the passage that we're uh, considering this time is again from, from Colossians chapter 2, and it's verses 9 and 10. And the title of the sermon is not the good man, <laughs> it is the God man. So from Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, this is the Word of God. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but this the Word of our God stands forever. Please pray with me. Lord, we just sense that in these words we've come to something very momentous, uh, quite profound. We've only read two verses, but we recognize that that's, that's quite enough. As we plumb the depths of these truths, Lord, give us clarity. Give us conviction and help us to stand in awe and wonder at a greater understanding of who it is whom we call Savior and Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today's social media world helps us to believe that we know something about just about everything, a little bit uh, anyway. So you look at all the tweets and all the texts and all the email messages and all the posts and you can begin to feel that, well, after all, you could probably hold your own in a discussion around the water cooler or the lunch table or maybe the neighborhood pub or even perhaps in a graduate seminar. The problem, of course, is that any knowledge we get simply by scrolling through the headlines is going to be pathetically shallow. And it's not that much better for people who read the newspaper. A recent poll showed that nearly six in 10 Americans who read the paper only read the headlines. Now that's as far as they go. So as consumers of all this information which we have, we find ourselves a mile wide and an inch deep and not having really a whole lot of uh, understanding, not knowing much about anything. Now, everybody knows something about Jesus. Uh, but as with other topics, uh, many people, even many in the church, know just enough to be able to chatter a little bit about Jesus, to hold some assumptions perhaps about Him, but in the absence of much real knowledge, true knowledge and understanding of who he is. And that can lead to an awful lot of trouble. For example, average churchgoers often can't distinguish between the Mormon Jesus or the Jehovah's Witness Jesus and Jesus as he's presented in the historic Orthodox teachings of Christianity. Let me tell you, that's a huge difference that we need to be able to understand and articulate. And not knowing much about Jesus makes us pray to those who would undermine his identity and authority and uh, who would try to persuade us that a biblical orthodox view that Jesus is the one Savior is, is just narrow-mindedness and, and mean. And even for true believers, not really knowing what we have, whom we have in Jesus can lead us to exhaust ourselves in running to and fro, here and there, looking unsatisfied for the kinds of things that Jesus alone can bring, that Jesus alone is, that He alone can give. And so in our text today, we have one of the weightiest 
one of the boldest statements in all of Scripture as to who Jesus really is. And here are th- at least three reasons why it's important that we understand it. First of all, we need to understand it if we are properly to worship Jesus. Who is it whom we proclaim here, before whom every knee should bow? How does he deserve to be worshipped? Unless we know who he is, we don't really grasp that. But that's not all there is. It's not just about Jesus. We need, secondly, to understand that if we are to avoid offending the Father, we must know the Son. Because the Bible says, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. And can we truly honor someone whom we misidentify or for whom we do not have adequate appreciation? And then third, we need to understand that if we are adequately to value the, the gospel and to benefit from the gospel of Jesus, this gospel which brings us light and brings us power and brings us um, illumination and all good things into our lives, this gospel uh, to which no one, neither man nor angel, can ever add anything. If we're to appreciate the gospel and live in its power, we have to know the one whose gospel it is. And I'm sure there are other reasons as well, but these three stood out to me. In the previous verses that we've seen already here in uh, Colossians, the apostle has warned the Colossians not to let anyone or anything draw them away from the gospel. Not hollow, deceptive philosophy, not human tradition, not worldly principles. He says the gospel of Jesus Christ is to be your focus, cling to Jesus, cling to the gospel. Now he goes on to tell them and to tell us why. The gospel is to be relied upon because of the divine identity of the one upon whom the gospel rests. Why is the gospel so much? Because the one on whom it rests is so much. Verse 9, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. In Jesus Christ there lives the fullness of of the deity, or as the King James translates, the fullness of the Godhead. Now, as we've said, it would be an ignorant man indeed who did not know something at least about Jesus. Everybody knows this man was born of his mother Mary, born there in uh, Judea where he lived among the Jews for a time. In the end, he was crucified by Pontius Pilate, that he rose again from the dead, that he commissioned his, his servants, his followers, his disciples to preach the message And then he allowed them to watch as he ascended into heaven. Everybody may not believe those things to be true, but everybody generally would know, at least in Western society, uh, those things about Jesus. We know that he looked like a man, any other man. That he was born and raised on earth. That he ate the same kinds of foods that we eat. That he got tired just as we got tired. That he grew through the uh, progressive stages of 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 growth from infant to uh, youth to uh, adult. And like everybody else, he suffered. He suffered griefs. He suffered temptations. He suffered hardships. He experienced even the pains of death, even a particularly gruesome death, death by being nailed to a cross, and that he too was buried in a tomb. Everyone knows this. But what everyone does not know is that in this man, in this very One lives all the fullness of deity. Now, deity means the nature, the very essence of God. That's what lives in this man, Jesus. In fullness. Now, in Scripture, fullness of something most often refers to whatever that thing contains. Fullness is a comment not so much on capacity as it is on content. And so the question would be then full of what? For example, in Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Whatever is found on earth, whatever, men, everything else that God has made, that's the earth's fullness. All the things that are found there are the content of the earth. Or or another illustration would be with Adam that he was first created to contain all the fullness of manhood. That is, everything that is required to be a man 
To be a human being was found in Adam, man's faculties, characteristics, properties, a body, uh, an immortal soul. He had understanding. He had free will. He had these same five senses that we have. Everything, in other words, that makes a man a man. So when we hear the apostle saying that the fullness of deity is in Jesus Christ, we should understand that he is referring to everything that makes God, God. Those perfections, those qualities of the divine nature itself, those things which the great and sovereign God himself consists in, the things that the theologians would call the attributes of God, all of this is found in Christ. The fullness of deity then is that rich, that inconceivable abundance of perfections constituting Godness, God's life. God's power, His wisdom, His justice, His vastness, His eternity, His holiness, and all the other attributes without which God would not be God, these are found in Christ. These dwell in Christ. So in Colossians 2.9, the Bible is saying, what God is, Christ is in fullness. Oh, well, some touches of these things, some, res- some resemblances of these attributes, these qualities may be found in other creatures that God has made, angels, certain men. But however excellent you may imagine angels to be or certain men to be, these qualities are found in them only slightly and then imperfectly. But with the Lord Jesus, these things are found fully. And so to make himself very plain at this point, Paul obviously does not want us to miss the fullness that he's speaking of. The apostle not content to say that the fullness of the deity is in Christ. He says all the fullness of the deity is in him. And so we can be assured that there is not any perfection or any attribute or any excellence of the divine nature that is not found in Jesus Christ, but all the fullness. And so in these few words, weighty words that he's given us, the apostle has declared in this concise statement all that Scripture teaches us in numerous other places concerning our Lord and Savior. John 1, he is full of grace and truth. 1 Corinthians 1, he is the wisdom and the power of the Father. John 6, he has the words of life. John 14, he is the way and the truth and the life. Colossians 2, in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Colossians 1, he has the might, the strength, which not only created all things, but which also sustains all things. Isaiah 9, he is the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Acts 17, he has the authority and the right to judge all men. And many other things besides these. Paul has gathered together all these truths into one short phrase, A few words carrying much freight, saying that all the fullness of deity lives in Jesus Christ. Because surely if any of these qualities or rights or names or attributes were missing, he could not have all the fullness of deity which is ascribed to him here. Is this the Jesus that you know? Is this the Jesus whom you worship? Is this the Jesus whom you serve? The real Jesus could not possibly be any more than he actually is. And so if your Jesus doesn't match up, then it must be because your Jesus is less. If your understanding of Jesus is not that he is one in whom all the fullness of deity lives, then with apologies to J.B. Phillips, your Jesus is too small. So get a view of, get an application, an appreciation for Jesus as he really is, the one in whom exists everything which makes God, God. But how does Christ possess these things? For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives 
in bodily form. It lives there. It dwells there. It's not just passing through. The verb speaks of settling down. That is, the fullness is not fleeting, it's not momentary, it's permanent. It doesn't come and go, as some heresies have alleged. And it dwells there in bodily form. Now this, of course, speaks of the incarnation of Christ, much the same way the apostle speaks of it in his gospel when he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. All that God is came to live in the body of a man. And the union of those two natures, the divine nature and the human nature, that union is so complete, so personal, so close, that these attributes, these two natures exist together in one person. Jesus Christ is one person consisting of two natures, a divine nature which is fully God and a man nature which is fully man. He is the God hyphen man. And that truth, as profound and then on the other hand as simple as it is, has been used over and over again to beat back a lot of bad, bad teaching about who Jesus is. Bad teaching from ancient times and bad teaching from modern times. In the year A.D. 325, a Constantine, the first Christian emperor of the Roman Empire, called the bishops of the church together. It was the first ecumenical or worldwide council of the Christian church. They met in the town of Nicaea, in what is now western Turkey. And about 300 bishops from all over, from Europe, and from India, other parts of Asia, from Africa, this worldwide council assembled there at uh, Nicaea. And the main item on the agenda was to clarify for the early church what it means that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. Scripture says this, but what does that mean? That Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. There was a man from Alexandria, one of the bishops from Alexandria, Egypt there. His name was Arius. He had been teaching that Jesus was the first and best creature that God made. He taught that there was a time when Christ was not but that later he was created by God the Father and given the status of God. Now that had many implications, but one of them was that the Son of God was not eternal like the Father, having been made, and also that he was not divine like the Father. He may have been divine, but in a different way, in a secondary way, an inferior way. Now these men met there for weeks and weeks and studied all this, 300 plus, all but two of them said that that was wrong. They denounced Arius, Arius and his teaching. They looked at Scripture, the verse in which Jesus says, I and the Father are one. The verse that says he was the Word and the Word was God. And they interpreted the Bible to teach that the Son is true God and is co-eternal with the Father, consisting, and here's the real kicker, consisting of the same substance as the Father. You know what substance is, Josh? It's, it's stuff. The same stuff as the Father is the stuff of which the Son also consists. Not a similar substance, this was the point of the crux of the debate. Was it a similar substance or was it the same substance? And the Council of Nicaea said it is the same substance. 
And so the, the product, the enduring product of the Council of Nicaea is what we know as the Nicene Creed, which states in part that Jesus Christ is God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. So with Nicaea, there is no saying that Jesus is just a man. With Nicaea, there's not even any saying that, well, Christ was more than a man, but nevertheless was created at the beginning. But with Nicaea, one must say that Jesus Christ is fully God, consisting of the same substance, substance as the Father, and just as eternal. Now, if this is true, and it is true, if in Jesus, who comes to be our Savior, who comes to be our Redeemer, who comes to be our brother, who comes to be our friend, if in him is found all the fullness of the deity, why would you look for anything else? Why would you look for anyone else? If you need mercy, if you need grace or consolation about which we've sung, or righteousness, or if you need merit before God, or assistance, or life, or wisdom, or any other good thing, in coming to Jesus, you have come to the right place. Because all of these are His to give. To give generously, to give quickly, because He is the one in whom all the fullness of deity lives. And furthermore, you will not find them anywhere else. Oh, maybe a drop or two here and there, some of them maybe, but nowhere fully, nowhere abundantly, nowhere perfectly as in Christ. And so my question to you is this, if you presently have such a treasure in your hand, why would you go begging anywhere else? Jesus Christ is our fullness, verse 10. And you have been given fullness in Christ. You have been given fullness in Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. Because he has fullness, you have fullness. The same word is used in both those, both those uh, verses. Fullness as to Christ, fullness as to you who believe in Christ. Now, we, we don't want to get confused here. You did not inherit his divine qualities. You did not inherit his attributes when you became a Christian. They don't just simply flow into you, at least not with perfection, not with completeness as they exist in Christ. But what you have been given is the benefit of friendship with the one in whom these divine qualities and these attributes do exist in perfection and in completeness. You, in other words, have not been given deity, but you have been given friendship with deity. In Christ, you have reached the source of richness and blessing that flows only from Him and that supplies whatever you need in this life and also, friends, whatever you need in the next. So what would be a reasonable, a just response? One thing that we would give to him our whole hearts. That we would not divide our worship or our devotion or our allegiance or our expectations between him and anything else since he alone has the fullness which is necessary to make us happy, to make us blessed. And he will communicate to us this goodness, this fullness, these, this di divine richness that dwells in him because he is good and he is kind and he is loving. And so trusting in him and resting in him, we'll find ourselves justified by his merit guided by his life, upheld by his power, enriched by his treasures, quickened by his spirit, and fed with his abundance. 
Arthur F. Burns was an economist. He was an immigrant, actually, um, from Ukraine. Changed his name when he came over as a young boy, Arthur Burns. He uh, was a consultant in economic matters for all the presidents from Eisenhower to Reagan. And he worked back and forth between the worlds of academia and government. He was also at one time the uh, U.S. ambassador to West Germany back when the country was divided. He was a man, there, therefore, of considerable gravity, uh, no lightweight. Although he was, he was medium in height, he was very distinguished looking, gray, uh, wavy hair, he departed it in the middle. Uh, his signature pipe almost always uh, in his hand. And when he spoke, uh, people listened. His opinions carried weight. Arthur Burns was also Jewish. And so when he began attending a weekly sort of informal fellowship, Christian fellowship and, and prayer time in Washington, people didn't quite know what to make of that. This was back in the 70s. Um, he showed up, he kept coming, and they accorded him special re uh, respect, but no one knew quite how to, how to involve him uh, in, in the group out of respect for him, but also out of some sensitivity to his uh, religious background. Uh, some, some man in the group would have a closing prayer, but they never called on Burns because they weren't sure how he would react to that. But one day, a newcomer was leading the group, and he didn't know Burns' background. And so at the end of the meeting, he asked Arthur Burns, please, won't you have our prayer? And Burns didn't miss a beat. He reached out his hands, as they typically did, and joined hands around the circle. They bowed their heads, and he closed in the prayer time. Some of the old-timers there who knew the situation sort of grimaced and looked sideways at each other, wondering what would happen. But when he prayed, he said this. He said, Lord, I pray that you would bring Christians to know Jesus Christ. I pray you would bring Jews to know Jesus Christ. I pray you would bring Muslims to know Jesus Christ. But also, Lord, I pray that you would bring Christians to know Jesus Christ. And may that be our prayer as well. Let's pray to him now. Father, sometimes we don't know what we have. And in our ignorance, we go looking for what we need in all the wrong places. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that in him exists all the deity in its fullness. Amen. Please stand and turn to 99. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. We're going to do verses 1, 2, and 